All right, a little bit of the class overview. Uh, so we are um, basically focusing uh, on, well, of course, fruit trees and, and fruiting plants. And we're going to talk about the maintenance during the early years. So kind of the training of your fruit trees. So we're talking sort of years one and three. We're going to go over some pruning details. Now I know we're going to uh, uh, be having a pruning workshop next week, but uh, pruning is a very uh, vital uh, element of maintaining your fruit trees. Uh, then we'll be talking a little bit about maintenance during the fruiting years, because that is uh, very much different. Uh, once these trees start producing fruit, um, it, it takes on a, a whole different level of maintenance. And then we will uh, talk about some of the insects, the diseases, and then the pest management uh, that, that uh, we'll need to follow up uh, for some of these insects and diseases, which mm, are, are pretty much almost inevitable uh, with, with a fruit tree here in the, uh, in the somewhat humid Midwest. So a little bit about orchard supplies. Uh, this is, uh, if, if you don't have some of these, you may want to look into purchasing some of these. Some of them you probably have. If you're a gardener, you have hoses. You have watering wands probably. But uh, do you have pruning and training supplies? And so that, uh, that's definitely important. Um, also the importance of a good hand pruner, a good pair of hand pruners. Uh, that, that cannot be uh, underestimated. Uh, so Felco number twos are, are kind of the, the industry standard. Uh, seeing as we're on video, I can actually show you Felco number two if you have your video screen pulled up. Um, so these are able to cut through uh, uh, inch thick wood uh, really easily. Uh, they sharpen easily and uh, uh, they're just a, a heavy duty, uh, comfortable pair of hand pruners. It, once your trees get to be a certain size, you will also need a trusty hand saw. And uh, so the particular hand saw that I really like to use is the Silky Zubat, but uh, these, uh, there are other hand saws out there. Uh, I, I, I think Silky makes a really good product and uh, you're able to cut through uh, anything larger than an inch to, gosh, even four inches, and it cuts like butter. Uh, this is not a bow saw. This is, uh, this is a, a nice, uh, nice hand saw. And then when you're doing pruning, you also will need some other things like rubbing alcohol to sterilize your pruning equipment between trees. So then as we get through some of this other stuff, yeah, weeding tools, pheromone traps, that, that, that can be important. And this also depends on how many fruit trees you have. There's, uh, I, could, I could talk two more hours on pheromone traps. Um, sprayers. Uh, sprayers are going to be very important. And depending on the amount of trees you have, uh, sometimes you can get away with a nice two gallon, uh, just pump sprayer. That will work really well if you have, let's say anywhere from, from two to four trees. Um, but uh, once you start getting uh, more trees than that, you'll want to invest in probably a larger sprayer and oftentimes a backpack sprayer. Uh, there are some nice sprayers out there. There are even battery powered backpack sprayers. So they, they, they have a pump that pressurizes, which is uh, incredibly handy when you are spraying a number of fruit trees. Um, rain gauge, you know, how much rain are you getting? That's, that's actually really important for the, uh, for the first uh, few years of life on your tree. And, and uh, the weatherman may tell you one thing, but that's 30 miles away from where you're living. Uh, and, and rain is, uh, can be sporadic from one side of town to the next. So it's, it's just helpful. Um, you'll need pesticides and you'll need fertilizers. And if you have a large enough orchard uh, or large enough trees and you have a large enough budget too, uh, it's, it's also recommended to uh, purchase an orchard ladder. 
and these are separate from your typical A-frame step ladder. These have a flared wide base and they have a telescoping third leg, which makes, uh, makes these incredibly versatile uh, within, uh, within the orchard. You can work on slight slopes. They are uh, incredibly stable too. Uh, your, your standard step ladder, you will fall over uh, if you get up in the tree. So uh, very much a, a great tool. So I'm going to reference this. If I go through each one of these bullet points, we will be here for a really long time. But uh, we do have on our website, uh, this is a, a monthly fruit management calendar. So this is, I think, uh, very important, kind of a month by month, sort of, you know, just a brief overview of what you will be doing in your orchard. Uh, so if, if you go to this uh, link up here, uh, you, this is a, a, um, a link to our uh, monthly fruit management calendar. And go to our website, You'll find that uh, you, it's two pages. You could even print it off as a PDF. So this is uh, this is really handy. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, as uh, right now for for us in the fruit tree business, uh, February is very busy, especially seeing as we missed two weeks because we are in a deep freeze. We're catching up, up with pruning. We're having to do some dormant oil spraying. Um, so there's a lot going on and, and really a lot goes on for us until May. And of course, when, once you get into June, you start looking at harvesting and things like that. Um, so I'm just going to brush over this. We'll talk specifics on some of this stuff a little bit later. I can already see I have a spelling error here. Darn it all. <laughs> um, okay. So Let's get into one of the sort of first maintenance items and what I see is probably one of the biggest maintenance items for fruit trees and fruit plants. Uh, it, is, it is pruning and, and pest management. Those are kind of the big two. But let's talk about pruning first because uh, hopefully uh, after this presentation, you'll, you'll go out and do a little bit. Uh, so why do we prune? Well, we prune for good tree structure. We prune for good sunlight and light intensity getting into the canopy. What causes a fruit bud to form? Sunlight. What causes a fruit to ripen? Sunlight. Um, and then we also are looking for good airflow in the tree canopy. So uh, we don't want really tight branches. We don't want a whole lot of little twiggy growth in the middle of the tree. We want, we, we want the air to move because anytime you have increased humidity in the tree, you will also have increased fungus and you will have the chance of increased disease in the tree. So then we're also uh, pruning to remove broken limbs and bad angles. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about some of the bad angles because uh, uh, these are oftentimes narrow angles that are, are not connected too well within the tree. We're taking out diseased limbs. Um, we're also improving the fruit quality and quantity. Now, sometimes we're actually, by quantity, it's less fruit, if you can believe that. But uh, with peaches, uh, a mature peach tree has a chance to put on a thousand fruits, but those thousand fruits will be the size of a golf ball. So uh, you would rather have 200, 250 fruits that are the size of a baseball. So in the case of peaches, you're pruning out some of the flower buds, some of the fruit buds, so you can get larger fruits. You can get better quality fruits, not a bunch of tiny fruits that you'll just be kind of scraping the, the meat off of the seed. Um, and then the control fruit, uh, control tree size. Uh, a number of fruit trees, especially pear trees, they can shoot upwards of, of 25 to 40 feet tall, uh, depending on what kind of rootstock it's on. So pruning can control the size of your trees. 
And that last bullet point is, is definitely true. Uh, fruit trees do grow very fast. It's not uncommon, uh, especially for the second year in the ground to get you know, four to five feet. Uh, sometimes you'll see eight feet of growth in, in certain trees in a year. So we really need to kind of keep on top of that. So some of you uh, have done this before. Some of you might be doing it this year, uh, purchasing a bare root tree. And so for those of you who uh, are purchasing a bare root tree, well, oftentimes they're coming in looking like a twig. And so this is, this is a, a very common state to see things. Um, so one of the first things you will be doing is if you don't have any branching is you will actually be heading that twig back. So you see where the line is there. That's basically at about three, three and a half feet up. You are cutting that off to actually promote the buds below it. So they will break. So they will start to branch. And then a new central leader will start to form. So if you look at the, the picture here on the right hand side of the branched whip, it's no longer a whip, but now it's, it's really in its uh, first leaf. Um, you see how it's branched out. If, if we were to leave this whip like this, it would, it would branch out, uh, but it might not branch out where you want it to and it would send up another three to four feet of growth uh, with maybe with branches, maybe without branches. So by making this simple heading cut, we are starting the process of branching of one of these young fruit trees. And that's, that's really important. This is how you control the, the shape of your tree from the very beginning. So um, here we are again with kind of, uh, so we're a little bit older now. We're, we're looking at a tree that's been in the ground uh, for a couple years now. So, so, and this in particular is an apple, but you know, this, this could also be a pear or an Asian pear too. Um, so so we, we look at this and, and we have our sort of before pruning picture here in the dormant season. And you see, well, we have a lot of, you know, nice branches. Hey, it grew some over the year. We thumbs up. We, we did a good job. We kept it alive. However, um, many of these branches are sort of right on top of one another. So, so we want to make sure that the branches are actually spaced out a little bit better. Uh, so we, we don't want one branch that is right above another branch, you know, four inches above coming out in the same trunk space. So we want well spaced. And so here we have, have the, the picture, um, picture on the right on the central leader picture. And with the ultimate goal of then creating a tree that looks like this, where we have branches that radiate outward and sort of this collection. Uh, these, are, these are lateral limbs uh, that uh, then are forming what's called a scaffold. Um, so this is, this is ultimately what we're looking for with apple trees. Now there's a whole pruning workshop that uh, we're, we're not doing today, but this, these are just some of the principles. Uh, peach trees, because they are a different animal than apple trees, they're a different animal than pears and, and uh, uh, Asian pears. Uh, so peach trees, for those of you who might have purchased some this year, uh, this is basically what it's going to look like this first year. This, uh, this you get it, you get it, uh, bare root tree, and it's pretty much a whip. It's, it's a, a twig. Maybe it has a couple of branches coming off. Well, just like with that, that first photo, we're also heading this back. We are taking this back and we're also taking some other limbs off of here. And this is still in the dormant season at planting. Well, here we are. It's starting 
to, to grow now. And so uh, ultimately it's growing. This is the first summer. Um, here we are the next year and you can see how much it has actually grown. So what we're doing with this is we're heading it back and then we're creating these scaffold branches that go outward and outward. We are not doing a central leader pruning the way we are with apples and pears and Asian pears. Now, the reasoning for this is peaches, peaches, one, they grow very quickly, uh, but two, they, they only have fruit buds that are born on the second year wood. Apples, pears, Asian pears, cherries, apricots, all of them, their fruit buds last much longer. But peaches, it is that second year. And so those flower buds break open, they get fruit, then they send out vegetative growth. The vegetative growth that keeps growing out and growing out will then keep producing fruit. But you don't want the tree to keep growing out and growing out because then eventually it will collapse. So peaches, you, you need to open up and you need to rejuvenate year in and year out. Another reason to have them so open is to allow that sunlight to come in and to allow that airflow to come in. And we'll talk about brown rot because brown rot's one of the things that, that causes uh, peaches to, to basically rot away. And that's why we really need to keep good sunlight and good airflow in on them. So here are sort of the different uh, styles of pruning. And, and so these are, these are more or less, you know, looking at kind of older mature uh, uh, peaches and, and cherries and apples. Um, so there's the central leader, which we talked about in some of those first slides. This is a, a pretty much a, a one dominant trunk that is more or less going straight upwards. You'll see there is branching coming off. You'll, you'll have your scaffolding. Uh, you have good spacing between the branches. And this is typically your apples and pears and, and Asian pears. Now here we have the modified central leader. And the modified central leader, you can see the central leader kind of branches off a little bit and then you have this well-rounded shape. Um, and this is common for uh, apples, pears, pears less so, uh, but cherries and plums. Um, and, and some of that for cherries and plums, they sort of naturally grow that way and, and uh, they, can get, they can get nice fruit crops and still grow that way. And plus they have the, the fruit buds that, uh, that will last five to six years. Now it's the peach over here that is that more open vase. And I would, I would kind of posit to say that this this picture is not even as open of a vase as it needs to be. Uh, but you don't have a defined central leader. It's very open. The, the branching gets started in the three to four foot range or two to four foot range and just opens up. So those are the different styles that you kind of need to pay attention to depending on the different uh, uh, type of fruit tree that you have. So let's also talk about trying to form decent branch angles on these fruit trees too, because uh, while, while you certainly can prune to form decent branch angles, there are also some other things that can be done. And this is, uh, this is very common, especially when you have all this young tender growth, uh, is you can, you can go ahead and stick a clothespin in between a lateral and your central leader to help form a good branch angle. And when I say good branch angle, I'm basically talking anything that's kind of between a 30 degree 
and 70 to 80 degree. Anything that is, is uh, under 30 degrees uh, will actually form a, uh, it's, it's basically too narrow of a branch angle and you'll end up getting dead uh, wood tissue in that branch angle. Uh, that will then lead to failure of a limb. And that's very common with uh, European and Asian pears, somewhat common in apples, uh, but uh, definitely European and Asian pears are very prone to these narrow branch angles. And so what we're doing is we're just tricking the tree. We're, we're, we're uh, interfering with, with uh, poor growth and trying to get something that will, will form better. So here we are, uh, kind of just a, a sketch on this. And you know, 45 to 60 is sort of the sweet spot, but anywhere from, from 30 to 80 is, is actually good. And, and the big thing is you don't want dead tissue between where the branch and the trunk meet. And oftentimes that looks like a little, uh, a little raised sort of scarred area. And I believe I have a, well, I don't have a good picture of that on, on this one. Uh, but these are the angles that we're looking for. And do this when your trees are very young, because uh, as, as, the, as those branches grow, you're making a bigger wound on the tree. So, so try to get the, the tree set very early on. So now I just want to kind of go through now these are some some pruning slides that we've uh, we've taken over the years on kind of before and after, and some you know this is applicable to some of the younger trees out there because these these trees were I believe uh, maybe two years in the ground, and so um, we we wanted to wanted to prune them and and make sure we we solved some of the problems with the trees. So here we are with a European pear, and, and some of you may have or will be buying a European pear. Uh, European and Asian pears, they, they tend to grow straight up. That is what they do best. Um, and you'll notice on this pear tree, if you follow some of these branches up, it looks like we have at least three leaders, three main leaders. Uh, so, we don't want three main leaders. We want one central leader and we want good branch spacing. So um, we ended up with the after product here. And what we did is put in some limb spreaders here and there to get better branch angles. We tipped back a lot of these other branches that were growing straight up and competing with our central leader. And we actually sort of reiterated, we, we redefined uh, what our central leader is. So, so now we have a better balance on this tree. We, we don't have the bad branch angles and we have pruned, we have tipped a number of these uh, former leaders. We have tipped them to an outside bud so they will end up growing outward and outward. And that's very important so we don't get a lot of interior growth because that interior growth will just shade out flower buds. And if any fruits do form, uh, they'll just get rubbed to death because uh, they're just getting rubbed by the wood, by the, the, by the branches, by, the, by, the, by everything. So uh, it's once again, really important to have, have that open canopy. Here is an example of a pear tree that really has never been pruned. So, uh, you know, if you're to drive by, you know, just going 30 miles an hour down the road, think, eh, well, there's a tree. But then when you realize that that, oh, that's a, that's a European pear tree, that's supposed to be producing fruit. So this just has a number of problems. The whole lesson behind this slide is to prune your trees before they get to this point. Um, so this has a number of horrible branch angles. Let me find my cursor again. 
So down here, really, where some of the some of these first branches come out, we have that that little dark area, that little ridged area where you have the dead tissue, where you have the poor connection. That's definitely uh, less than a 30 degree angle. That's 15. That's maybe a 10 degree angle coming off of there. And honestly, we have that going throughout the whole tree. And then you get up into the tree a little bit more, you find that some of these limbs have twisted around other limbs and they've they've started growing together. So this is just a real mess. And, and the whole goal is to get fruit out of a, a fruit tree, um, but that, that was not happening here. So the lesson is prune before it gets to this. And this, I think we stumbled across this maybe, maybe five or six years after it had been growing. Uh, so this had been growing for five or six years without pruning. So uh, just you know, pay attention to your trees a, a couple times of year uh, for pruning. This time of year for sure, and with your pears again uh, in August. Another thing is, and this has to do with pretty much all fruit trees, is don't get suckered. And I'm not talking about buying the wrong variety, um, but, but there's some truth to be said there too. Uh, but don't let the rootstock suckers take over. So all, pretty much all fruit trees are grafted onto a separate rootstock. That rootstock is there to help control size, help control adaptability um, to the soils. Maybe it has some insect resistance, maybe it has some disease resistance. But that rootstock also grows and it will come up from below the graft and it will send these shoots out. And depending on the rootstock, sometimes those shoots will be somewhat aggressive. So these rootstocks, this, this rootstock was allowed to grow for two growing seasons. Here is our scion, our variety right here. Um, and as you can see, these rootstock suckers are starting to actually compete. And in some cases, what will happen is they will outcompete the scion variety. So basically what you need to do is you just need to cut those off and you need to pay attention uh, and around the base of the tree. And if you see those rootstock suckers, just get them out of there. And then I alluded to this earlier, but using, uh, using limb spreaders uh, is, is also very helpful uh, to creating good branch angles. So here's a little bit of a simplified pruning schedule. And, and I say simplified because this is, <laughs> we're trying to squeeze a lot in here. Um, so uh, basically now until the fruit trees break bud and, and uh, I, I'm hoping we have until mid-March, although all of these you know, 50 and 60 degree days worry me, um, but you're pruning fruit trees. Basically uh, apples, pears, Asian pears are kind of first on the list and then you prune your peaches as they get a lot closer to bud break. Blackberries, you'll definitely need to be doing some pruning and I have some slides on pruning blackberries, but you'll need to uh, all of the all of the main canes and then you have laterals, you'll need to prune the laterals off uh, back to 12 to 15 inches. All of your raspberries, uh, this is a very good time to just take them back all the way to the ground. Uh, especially if you have uh, one of the primocane varieties uh, like like Caroline and Heritage, uh, those are those are the two that we have offered over the years. Now, if you have a fluorocane variety like black raspberries or purple raspberries, you treat them the way you treat blackberries. There's a whole other class with this we're not going to talk about. Um, so. Uh, the figs, some of you may have figs. Uh, I always tend to leave those alone until I start to see green on them, until I start to see bud break, which sometimes can be, uh, as, and it's normally late April, but sometimes can be early May. 
And then in midsummer, uh, this is also another good time to do some pruning, but not on everything. So uh, you absolutely have to be pruning your blackberries in midsummer. Uh, you're, you're tipping them, and uh, if you have a trellis set up for them, you need to tie them to the trellis line. You're also getting out the uh, fruited canes on all of your blackberries. So blackberries, they fruit in June and July. Once they're done fruiting, remove those canes that have the fruits on them. Uh, but then you'll have all your vegetative canes that you'll still be, you'll still be training. Uh, and then with the apples and pears, uh, this is a good time to remove your suckers and your water sprouts. Uh, it's also a good time to uh, uh, start topping your, your apples, pears, and Asian pear trees. And this is uh, to get them down to size. If, if any of you have been out to our facility here, you've seen the Asian pears that we have just to the north of our building. Take a look at those next time you're here and see that, that we have made topping cuts on those. They, they're basically, we've taken uh, four to six feet out of the tops of those. So now each one of them is, is right around the 12 to 13 foot range, uh, which is, is actually much more manageable than, well, 16 to 18 feet. So uh, topping uh, can happen on your, on your poem fruits. Uh, in, in the August midsummer time frame. So a couple other tasks, a few other tasks that you'll want to think about for your young trees. Um, of course, there's the dormant pruning. Ah, then there's dormant oil sprays. And dormant oil sprays can be uh, a, a good way to smother out uh, some of the insects that would, would otherwise be causing foliar problems on your trees uh, as the growing season goes on. So this is actually a great time to be applying dormant oil. Um, so this third point, uh, can't say enough about this. For your very young fruit trees, uh, you'll want to pinch off all of the either fruitlets or flowers for the first couple of years. So we want roots and shoots and not fruits. We, we, we want that tree to get rooted in. We want it to grow a good structure, but all of the, uh, a fruit load on a tree like that, it takes away nutrients, it takes away water, and it also uh, it also will, will end up weighing the tree down. I don't know if, how many of you have seen a six foot tall apple tree that's, uh, that's leaning almost to the ground before. I've seen it multiple times and it's because people have left 50 fruits on a tree that's been in the ground for one year. So can't reiterate that enough. Uh, tree training, uh, that's, you know, that's the use, use of limb spreaders. Uh, there's the blackberries, there's the summer pruning, and then there's mulching. And we'll, we'll get into some of this a little bit more. So now we're going to talk about uh, sort of uh, some of the, as your trees get a little bit older, um, what, what the maintenance on the trees looks like. And so there's still very much the dormant pruning needs to happen. You'll need to mulch. There's the dormant oil spray, but then, once we get into this fruit producing stage, we need to start thinking about insects and insects getting into fruits. And this is, you know, there, are, you, can, you can grow fruits without spraying, uh, but it's, it's going to be very labor intensive. We'll talk about some options here later on. But uh, in general, there are some organic uh, insecticides that you can be using as what's called a petal fall spray. So that's something you wanna keep in mind. We're gonna revisit that later in the presentation. Then there's fruit thinning. We'll talk about what fruit thinning looks like. Tree training, we've been over that a little bit. There's the summer pruning, there's the blackberries. Oh, but finally you get into the harvest, which is just, you know, that's, that's what, what you're there for. Um, and then uh, we also need to start managing fertility just a little bit better now that these trees 
are producing fruit. Because they're producing fruit now, they're using up a lot more nutrients that are in the soil. So we need to look at, at fertilizing. We also need to look at, at uh, compost application to your site because uh, that compost uh, has more organic material, more nitrogen, and so that, that will help uh, with, with your soil fertility and uh, nutrient uptake in the trees. So let's talk about this uh, blossom pinching and fruit thinning aspect. And so uh, we have this slide and, and uh, I wouldn't have thought this would be an issue, but, but uh, you know, people have done this before where they've actually ended up pinching off leaf buds on their trees and not flower buds. So we wanna make sure that you know, the first two years these are in the ground, you are actually pinching off individual flower buds. And, and what that looks like is you're just going through and you're pinching those flowers right off the tree. This sounds antithetical to, to what you bought the fruit tree for, but uh, trust me, uh, these, these are 20, 30, 40 year perennial systems. You want them to live that long. Um, and here we look at uh, what it looks like to remove a little fruitlet. The smaller the fruitlet, the easier it is to remove. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're thinning all of your fruits. So here's kind of a, uh, a sort of a very typical uh, what you would see. Uh, this is an apple tree. And as, as we go down the branch here, you'll see we have you know, a number of fruits per cluster on each one of these. So our ideal is to get down to about one fruit per cluster. And in some cases, you might leave two fruits per cluster if they are positioned sort of uh, away from each other on that flower bud. But uh, really, we don't want those fruits to touch as they continue to size up, as they continue to ripen. And really, when you're talking apples, you, you want about four inches of space from stem to stem on each apple. Uh, so, so this is a process that takes a little bit of time. And, and uh, once again, the more trees you have, the longer this will take, but be prepared to spend that time because you will get much better fruit. You will get larger fruit. You will get less blemishes on your fruit. So, um, the only thing I'm missing in this picture is when the tree, when the fruits were actually attached to the tree. But we did a good job of salvaging the position that these these are Asian pears here, and this is this is a, a sort of fruit thinning. And and um, this particular these pears were obviously thinned much later than they should have been. They need to be thinned at about the size of of uh, my little. Uh, little diagram here. So these were hanging on the tree like this. And notice where they are actually touching in that photo, there you have a weak spot. And that weak spot, that's perfect for little, little moth larvae, i.e. caterpillars, uh, typically oriental fruit moth, or uh, codling moth to get in and ruin the fruit. So it's a good reason to not have your fruits touching because they're just rubbing together right there on the tree uh, and causes those, those tender spots. So can't, uh, you can't underestimate the power of, of thinning fruits. Um, of course, another reason to thin fruits is broken branches. And that's exactly what we had going on here with this peach tree. Uh, for one, there was kind of a pruning issue that this peach tree had or didn't have. Um, but then there were just all of these fruits weighing down the limbs. And, and one, so these fruits are of course touching. and 
groups can touch and you can sometimes still get good fruits. It's not, you know, that's not always the case where you're going to get bad fruits, but you'll get smaller fruits, but you will have a, a heavy, heavy load that will cause breakage. So with peaches, you know, we talked about apples being kind of four inches between each fruit stem to stem. Peaches, you want about six to eight inches uh, stem to stem. So now we're going to talk about uh, kind of shifting gears from fruit thinning to uh, our blackberries, because that is that is another thing. And some of you may or may not have blackberries. I know I get get a lot of questions. Uh, people want to grow them up along their fence. And, and I always uh, kind of try to uh, uh, persuade them to a different option. Uh, lo look at, at sort of building a, a trellis, um, uh, almost like a clothesline type trellis. And that's, that's what we utilize a lot because of the way blackberry canes grow. Uh, so this clothesline trellis allows, and here we have actual photos of the clothesline trellis. So it allows for the blackberries to be grown on two different sides, on this side and that side, but we alternate the way the canes are grown. So what I mean by that is, let's go back here. So we have our our red, our red uh, perforated dashed line there. Those are new, newly emerging vegetative canes. The black lines here are the canes that will be fruiting this year. So, so they're in the process of fruiting right now. These other ones are in the process of growing. Those ones that are growing, you want to tie up to the opposite trellis line than the ones are fruiting. And the reason there is once these ones that are fruiting are done fruiting, you will be cutting them down. So you're going on one side of that trellis, you're taking all those canes out. The other side, you're just leaving those. They're all, they're tied up to the other side, they're vegetative, they're going to be next year's canes. So for those of you who have blackberries, this well, you know, this is, blackberries are maintenance, um, but you will get quite a reward for doing this maintenance. Uh, we're talking, we're talking, you now I don't know how many gallons, uh, but multiple gallons. So it, it's worth uh, uh, spending a little time to have a trellis put in, don't tie them up to a fence. And this is, uh, this in particular here is blackberry maintenance during the dormant season. And so you'll see we have all of the growth from, from the previous year. And we're actually thinning out a lot of that growth. So it's less cluttered. And then we have all of these canes and you can't really see the laterals on the canes but all of these canes will be producing fruit. If we left all of this on here, there would be sort of this mess of foliage and fruit and, and you wouldn't be able to really, you wouldn't be able to find all the fruit and the fruit quality would be far inferior. So pruning raspberries, I think we, we kind, of, uh, kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I don't want to get into the cane biology too much. Like I said, uh, our varieties that we've offered over the years, Caroline and Heritage, and, and we, we are offering Caroline this year. Um, you can come pick up uh, bare root uh, raspberry plants as soon as our cool season plants go on sale. I believe that is March 25th or 26th. Um, so Caroline is a primocane variety, which means it goes through its whole cycle in one year. Uh, so it starts growing, starts emerging in March and April. Then it starts to flower and fruit the, uh, the end of July, beginning of August. And then it'll fruit until we have our first hard, hard freeze. 
because uh, they can withstand frost and actually still continue to put on some berries, but it's that hard freeze that knocks them back. And then next year you get a new set of canes. These are perennial crops. Uh, but but once, once they have been knocked back by the hard freeze and they've dropped all, all their foliage, you can cut them down then or you can cut them down right now. So it, it makes it really easy. Um, like I said, the other, uh, the other style is the Floricane and that's managed very similarly to the way the blackberries are managed. Speaking of fruit trees, I think I have a shipment coming in. All right. Um, so let's get into mulching. Uh, so this is also another thing that you'll want to do with your fruit trees. Um, just like any tree, any tree you have out in the yard, even your flower beds, you're probably familiar with mulch. Uh, so the bigger the mulch ring, the better. And I'm not talking a tall mulch ring. I'm not talking volcanoes up against the trunk mulch ring, but I'm talking about a nice 18 to 24 to even as the tree grows 36 inch radius from the trunk of uh, wood chip mulch. Now, uh, around here, what we use is, uh, I mean, it's basically, it's almost straight from the tree trimmers. We, we get it in, we, we turn the pile, uh, the pile kind of breaks down a little bit and then, and then we'll go out and use that. Um, so the nice thing is, is it's a, it's a somewhat uh, fresh mulch. It is, uh, it's not, uh, it's not made from big heartwood chunks, or or it's not made from pallets, uh, which you'll actually find pallet mulch out there. Uh, so so mulch does a lot of things for the tree. For one, it breaks down, which is actually good. You want your mulch to break down. You want it to decompose. A decomposing mulch actually adds organic material to the soil. It helps with uh, drainage in the soil. Um, the mulch also acts as a buffer. So when we, uh, when we have our really hot spells, our hot dry spells, it'll keep that moisture in but it also keeps the soil temperature a little bit cooler. When we have the depths of the cold like we just had, the, uh, the mulch will once again provide that insulation layer there. We typically uh, put mulch about two to four inches deep and, and like I say, in that 18, 24, 36 inch radius, depending on the size of the tree. Um, and then we never really have the mulch right up next to the trunk though. The, the, the mulch layer thickens as you go away from the trunk. Oftentimes this is a once a year process, um, but uh, really depending on the way the site is, sometimes it's a couple times a year. Another thing is of course the mulch will help keep weeds away. And in some cases it's a nice visible barrier to keep uh, lawn equipment away. And uh, we face that, that problem in, in uh, sort of more municipal settings with, with uh, lawn equipment. As a homeowner, uh, just, just don't hit your trees with the lawnmower or the weed eater. All right, so now we're gonna, we're just gonna touch on a few of these uh, because this is also a, a, a long, uh, each one of these could take a while. But uh, these are a number of the common diseases out there uh, for uh, your fruit trees. And uh, with the fruit trees that we offer for sale, um, a lot of them actually have good resistance to some of these. Uh, especially with our apples. Uh, they all have good resistance to uh, those, those four diseases there. Uh, and with the pears, we have good resistance to fire blight. But some of these things, there's just not good resistance to. And I wanna touch on a couple that, that you probably will see out there uh, with your fruit trees. So first off, this is fire blight and um, 
This is something where certain years we have very severe out outbreaks of it. Uh, other years we don't see it really that much at all. So this is a, uh, a bacteria that actually works its way in through the flowers of the tree. And you can see with our, our stem right here, if you look there, you can see some old flowers. And basically this is transmitted, it's transmitted in a couple different ways, but one way is it's transmitted through pollen, uh, pollinators. So it'll transmit from one pear tree to another, a pear tree that has been uh, infected, and then it will infect this pear tree and then it gets in and it starts killing all the woody tissue. And this will go down, down the branch and sometimes get into the trunk of the tree. So if you see this shepherd's crook, this burnt, burnt look uh, sometime in May or June or even July, uh, you need to kind of take a, a evasive action uh, right away. Um, so you, you need to prune it out and you need to prune it out below what this bottom photo shows. So this is actually the canker in the wood and you need to prune it out below where that canker is. Uh, and then you need to get rid of that piece of wood, get it out of the orchard, throw it in the trash can um, because it can re-inoculate uh, another section of that tree, or if you have any other apple pear or Asian pear around, uh, it, it could spread to those. So like I said, this spreads one way, it spreads through pollinators uh, going from flower to flower. It also spreads um, through, uh, through wind or rain or through hail. So if you have damaged foliage, and you have the fire blight that is right there and you have the perfect temperatures, it will transmit from one leaf to another. And hail is actually one of the, one of the best ways that this, this happens. Uh, so this is something you just need to be aware of. If you see it, prune it out because it can kill your tree. Now we, we they're a, an orchard that we work with uh, they're going to have to remove uh, two trees that were planted uh, in 2012, and these have been great productive trees, but uh, they got fire blight so bad on them and got it into the trunk that uh, it's now time to remove them. So it's, it's unfortunate. Another thing that you might see, and this happens uh, uh, on all of the stone fruits, so uh, cherries, peaches, plums, apricots, is brown rot. So brown rot is something, and um, you can see this is sort of the, the stage that a lot of people will see it. Uh, you see the, the very, very distinct uh, little spores there uh, on the cherries themselves. So what happens is uh, basically you will have this bottom photo, you'll have these mummies is what these are called. These mummies are housing spores of brown rot and they've been left on the tree. Uh, maybe, maybe some of them have fallen onto the ground and then you get the right weather conditions and this will then, it can do uh, a couple of different things. It can infect a blossom uh, or it can uh, infect a fruit. And by the time it starts getting on the fruits, this can be pretty difficult to eradicate because these spores will just take to any wind. If somebody brushes up against the, the plant, the spores will just travel everywhere. And so then they'll travel from cherry to plum, from plum to peach. Uh, normally they're not too much of a problem in cherries because our cherry season is so early here and we're able to get a good harvest. Um, but it's definitely a bigger problem with plums and uh, to a lesser extent peaches that are near uh, other stone fruits. So um, this is something where 
you know, we, we have a, a couple solutions for it, but they're not really the best solutions, both sulfur and copper uh, fungicides. But uh, doing things like pruning, so you have good air circulation, you don't have too much crowding in the interior. Removing, anytime you see these mummies, get them out of there. So that's, that's sanitation. Um, so yeah, but that's something you probably will see. This is something um, that, <laughs> and this is actually just, this is from an old little poster that I made up to put at our front desk uh, years ago because we were just getting so many calls from people. It's like, okay, yeah, well, so yes, it's peach leaf curl. It's peach leaf curl. Um, probably uh, from April 15th to May 15th, I'm sure I'll still be fielding calls about peach leaf curl. It's just year in and year out. Uh, so this is something that you will see deformed peach leaves. And this is actually a very mild case. Uh, I, I don't have the great photo of, of a horrible case of peach leaf curl, but in a horrible case of peach leaf curl, every leaf will look like this, and then every leaf will drop off. The thing is, the tree will leaf out again. Um, and by the time you see this on your peach trees, you can't do a thing about it. It's, it's too late. There's no spray in the world that is going to solve this problem right now. Uh, so, so you do have to basically uh, apply a, a spray later on in the season. And what that looks like is spraying copper fungicide uh, or sulfur uh, when the tree is mostly defoliated in November. So this is a, a November time frame. You get in there when the buds are actually still open uh, before they close up for winter dormancy and you spray the tree and you spray the ground beneath it. You also then, however, need to spray the tree once again as we get close to bud break uh, this time of year. And so that will that will help, a, that should help knock your peach leaf curl out. Uh, some years are worse than others. Once again, it's all, all depends on how wet the spring is. Um, and some trees get it worse than others. Uh, so there's uh, the Red Haven variety, which we, we sold out of earlier, uh, earlier in our fruit tree sales. It has pretty good resistance to peach leaf curl. So, so that's, that's important because peach leaf curl can, it will affect harvest. It will affect how many fruits will stay on the tree and will ripen on the tree. So uh, it's, this is serious enough to, to do something about. All right, so let's kind of talk insects now. Um, and we're gonna try to get, the, I think 1.30, 2 o'clock. I'm hoping to be done by this 1.30. So if you have to check out, I'd, um, uh, but let's, let's carry on. So uh, let's talk about some of these insect pests. And for us, most of these insect pests are these moths, different types of moths. And so this is a nice little photo here, or not photo, but illustration of a life cycle. Now, right now, we're in sort of this pupa stage. Uh, the, the moths of the oriental fruit moth, the moths of the codling moth, are, they're right here. Well, once we start to warm up, and this typically coincides with, uh, with uh, flower, uh, flowers are opening or, or we're getting bud break, but it, it coincides with our fruit trees waking up as well these will pupate into their adult form. At that point, they mate, they lay their egg, and they'll lay their egg close by where their host is going to be, which what that means is they're either laying it on the foliage right next to the flower cluster, or maybe they're laying it right after the petals have fallen on that little pea-sized fruitlet. So, these insects know they they're trying to uh, uh, continue the species, and so they know where to lay their eggs and when to lay their eggs. 
So from there, you have your larva hatching out and the larva goes through these stages. So this is all important to know. It's important to know what plants are hosts. Well, we're planting fruit trees. Yes, they are host plants. Uh, and we need to know how to disrupt their life cycle. I'll tell you, it's easier to disrupt their life cycle when, when they're kind of either in this egg state or this larval state. Uh, as you get into sort of the fifth stage, they become a little bit tougher to eradicate. Uh, once they're in the pupa, that becomes pretty difficult. So it's hard to eradicate once they're in, in the pupa stage. And when they're in the adult moth stage, uh, you can't really spray for moths. You can try to trap for them, um, but, but you, you can't really spray your way out of that situation. So let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of these pests. And first, I kind of want to go through foliar pests and sort of maybe more, more uh, general pests, if you will, uh, because there are a lot of pests out there. So oriental fruit moth is actually, it's both a foliar pest and it's a fruit pest. Um, aphids, see them a lot. You can rub them off with your fingers. You can blast them with high pressure water. In general, I don't try to worry about aphids much. The peach tree borers, I've got a slide on this. This, this is very important for all of us to pay attention to. We have loopers, we have bagworms, we have Japanese beetles. Um, just so you know, all of these are, are kind of minor pests, but if you have let's say three of them or four of them attack the same tree year in and year out, that tree is going to weaken. That tree might even die because it's not putting out the foliage. It needs the foliage to photosynthesize to feed the roots. So, so just so you know, they're out there and they can cause problems. So here's a little bit about the, the greater peach tree borer. And if any of you have grown peaches or cherries or, or plums or apricots. You may have seen this over the years. So you look down and you see sort of this black sticky stuff at the base of the trunk. Or maybe you see some oozing really down low on the trunk. Well, here's the black sticky stuff as you start to as you start to pull up uh, the, the sticky stuff and, and you get some of the soil and look there, you see those larvae in there. Those are the larvae of the, of the greater peach tree borer. And in some cases you'll find 10 or 15 of these. Uh, and basically it's that, uh, it's in here within this trap, it's these things that look like wasps. Uh, these are these are a clear winged moth and they're laying their eggs right around the base. These eggs hatch in well, kind of May, June, and then the caterpillars, they start going through their, their little life cycle and they're eating away and they're girdling the tree. I've seen <clears throat> multiple instances over the years of of a perfectly, at least, looks healthy tree at the top. Uh, then, you know, you get to midsummer, and all of a sudden, all the foliage has just dried on the tree. That is uh, a peach tree getting girdled by peach tree borers. Uh, so, there are a few things you can do. Deworming is really about the best thing you can do right now. Uh, and if you see this around your peach tree, get out the pocket knife, start scraping back the frass, find the tunnels and pull the worms out. Um, you, can, you can spray your trunks uh, during, the, during the season from May to September with, with neem and neem oil will act to deter the pest. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these insecticides that, that will, will help with this a little bit later. 
Japanese beetles, because everybody asks about it. Japanese beetles are a generalist. They, um, they eat over 300 different crops. And so fruit trees just happens to be one of them. Uh, they prefer, uh, at least in, in our realm, they prefer sweet cherries. They prefer hazelnuts, grapes, and raspberries. Uh, so, so we have to, to kind of take some extra precautions uh, with some of those plants. Um, I thought I'd also mention Japanese beetle traps because that is something where there's a lot of controversy around it. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, if I, if I put a trap out there, it's, it's just going to attract all of my neighbors, Japanese beetles, or, or my neighbors won't like me because I'm bringing uh, Japanese beetles into the neighborhood. Well, that's with your sort of standard quart sized or gallon bag sized trap that you'll find at, at your typical hardware store. And what we have, uh, what we've started using uh, are these Japanese beetle uh, mass traps. And this is something, if you, if you want more information about it, I, I believe we, well, we do have a YouTube video on how to make these traps, but we, we actually learned this through the, the uh, integrated pest management over at Lincoln University. So they did a bunch of field studies using large trash cans and a pheromone trap. And these trash cans spaced about 40 feet from the target crop uh, did a really good job at trapping the Japanese beetles. And of course they, they die after a while, um, but it traps a lot of the Japanese beetles where those quart traps and those two gallon, one gallon, two gallon bags fail is they fill up and they fill up right away. Uh, in some cases they could fill up in a day. It takes quite a while for a 30 to 40 gallon trash can to fill up with Japanese beetles. So this is the kind of thing where you can just set and you can forget it until the Japanese beetle season is over. So there are some other things you could do about Japanese beetles. Um, there is a product called Milky Spore, which is basically a, a soil bacteria that you would apply to the soil that is ingested by the grubs of the Japanese beetles. And then it ends up killing the grub of the Japanese beetle. Um, what we will often also do is we will, on some of our crops that are affected most, like raspberries, like sweet cherries, we will do a half percent neem spray, and we'll leave, we'll mix in this this product called kale and clay uh, as well, and we'll we'll talk about these particular products uh, down the road here. All right, so now I want to touch a little bit on some of our uh, fruit pests, and and with all of this, you know, there there are so many different pests. Uh, but like I say, I want to touch on just just two or three here. These are the ones that that we end up facing uh, the most. And so there's there's the codling moth, which is typically apple and pear. There's oriental fruit moth, which is typically your stone fruits. There's this little guy, the plum cucurlio. It's a, it's a little weevil, which it will, it will attack a little bit of everything, actually. And then there are some, uh, this new actor on the scene, the brown marmorated stink bug. And then there is the giant green June beetle. Uh, so these are all ones that, that we face year in and year out. I, I would tell you that codling moth and oriental fruit moth are, are probably uh, the, the, the worst ones we have around here. Plum cucurlio would, would be next. So let's kind of dive into this oriental fruit moth a little bit deeper and, and how, uh, how it completes its life cycle. So for those of you with peaches, and, and notice uh, peaches, I've, I've, I've focused a lot on peaches. Peaches are a lot more maintenance if you haven't gotten that message uh, already. 
Uh, peaches have more pest problems. You have to prune peaches more. Um, but they're they're kind of a really tasty fruit, so we like them. Um, so here is uh, what's called a tip strike by an oriental fruit moth. So you have the female moth. What she does is she'll lay an egg on the apical tip, so on, on the top tip of, of a peach tree, or in some cases, cherry, in some cases, plum, uh, and lays that egg. And then the caterpillar hatches out. And the caterpillar then is eating within the pith here. So it's eating within that, that leaf stem uh, or, or a twig stem. And so if you see this in your peach tree, and you'll, you'll see this probably starting in early June, uh, maybe mid-June, you need to cut that out uh, of the tree so this little caterpillar does not continue its life cycle. Now, um, the oriental fruit moth can have up to seven generations a year in our area. So what that means is this little guy will complete its life cycle, then it becomes a moth, then another generation, then another generation, then another generation, and another generation, and maybe another generation as we go throughout the growing season. But they don't just stop at sort of the, the twig tips and leaves. Uh, the next generations will start to get into the fruits. And so that's where the problem really comes in. Um, so remove the infected stems. That's, that's kind, of, kind of the first one. Um, another thing is if, uh, if you have the ability to kind of work up the soil or even work up the mulch a little bit this time of year, uh, this can actually kill the larva. Um, if you have some chickens that you can get working around your, uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable. I don't like that. <laughs> Um, okay, if, if you have chickens, uh, you can actually have them around your trees and they'll scratch around and find the larva. Um, if you feed the birds, feed the birds this time of year underneath your trees because birds also scratch around and birds will find the larva of oriental fruit moth. Um, of course, some of these other controls, these chemical controls will work, but there has to, they have to be sprayed at a certain time. And we'll talk about spraying here in a little bit. Here's codling moth. Just like oriental fruit moth, it uh, focuses on fruits. Uh, we just have less generations a year. And it typically is a problem with apples, pears, and Asian pears. Um, but it, it very much right now is overwintering uh, around the bases of your trees. And then let's, uh, let's just take a look at this one really quick because uh, there are a lot of stink bugs and a lot of stink bugs that do cause damage. Uh, this is just kind of a new kid on the block here or a newer kid on the block. And this causes damage not only to fruits, but also peppers and tomatoes. So any of you who have your vegetable garden, uh, you might see this. Also, you've, you've maybe seen this uh, in your house or coll uh, collected on the south side of your house, maybe in the attic. Uh, these, uh, so these got introduced uh, to to the US uh, in the East Coast about 15 years ago and have been making their way and they're now here. Uh, they've been here for the past few years. Uh, so you'll see their damage on apples, especially as we get into the late season. It can be very difficult to control adult beetles uh, and can best control them in the younger stage. And you'll see that, that younger, the nymph uh, down there. So once again, uh, uh, MU has some good information on uh, integrated pest management for these. 
is still there's not there's not a good silver bullet to control uh, this this insect yet. And this is one for all the berry growers out there. Uh, another one to look out for, uh, especially if you've been growing uh, uh, brambles for a number of years. This is a fruit fly, uh, and but it's not a not your typical fruit fly because it actually lays its eggs within within a, an uncompromised fruit. So most fruit flies will lay their eggs in a fruit that's already been softened, already been compromised. This actually, it has a little appendage, this ovipositor that can puncture the fruit and lay eggs into the fruit. Uh, there are uh, some good ways that you can uh, make some traps and Lincoln University is another good resource for how to make these traps. But then I want to get to just kind of some some no brainer things that, that you you should be doing when you have fruit trees and and this will this will make sure you don't have too much of a pest uh, a fruit pest buildup. And of course, the longer you have fruit trees, the more your orchard uh, becomes a known quantity. Uh, the, the pests know you're there. And so so sometimes the first few years of growing fruit, you can get away without having pests, but as the years go on, the pests will find you. So making sure you don't have a situation like this, cleaning up all the fallen fruit, um, you know, removing your diseased wood, rem uh, you know, removing broken wood, um, cleaning tools. And then at the end of the year, uh, and this is really important is, is uh, mowing that orchard floor a little bit shorter. You know, that orchard floor might just be your lawn, uh, but, but mow things uh, a little bit shorter, especially right around the trees, because that's where a lot of your either fungal pests or insect pests can overwinter. There are some other things you can do too that will just help with the general biodiversity uh, in pest management for your orchard. Um, so because fruit trees naturally bring in pests, you plant it, they will come. Um, the oriental fruit moth will find your peaches. The, the peach tree borer will find your peach trunks. Adding some other plants that flower throughout the year will bring in beneficial insects. And I'm talking about different predator insects that will actually start to start to work for you in the orchard. So the, the more sort of floral diversity that you have in your orchard, the more likely you are going to have more predator insects that will be working to control some of the fruit pest insects that you have. Now we're getting into, now we're going to be talking about some of the organic controls, organic spray controls, but here is something that is a barrier control that uh, if you don't have too many fruit trees, uh, this is actually a very good option. Uh, a, a no spray option uh, for your fruits. And this is bagging the fruits. So uh, right here, this top photo, we have, uh, these are basically little nylon footies. And uh, these are, uh, these. you can now find these at a lot of different uh, orchard supply and garden centers online. So you're basically tying this little footie around the fruit when the fruit is you know, about dime uh, to nickel size. And then you just leave this on until the fruit ripens. So they're breathable, but they also uh, don't allow for an insect to lay an egg on the actual fruit itself. Uh, so this is a, a, a good way to do it, but it takes time. Uh, each one of these little bags, you know, it takes 
30 seconds or so to tie on to a fruit. Uh, so, okay, you're, you, you have 200 fruits on a tree. Well, you, you can do the math there. Um, so, and I think 30 seconds is kind of generous. It, it can take a little bit longer. Um, another way you can do this is you can actually use Ziploc bags as well. Now, Ziploc bags, uh, you have to notch the top middle of the Ziploc bag to be able to close it around the stem. And then you need to notch out a corner of the bottom of the bag so there's no water that builds up in the bag. And it also uh, makes sure the humidity doesn't build up in the bag. Now, the problem with Ziploc bags is they don't work at all for any of your stone fruits, your plums, your peaches, or your apricots. So you can use the nylon footies for those. Uh, Ziploc bags can work for apples and pears and Asian pears. So like I say, that's a good no spray way, but it does take time. So. Speaking of spraying, let's get into a little bit of sort of a spray schedule uh, and what this actually means and what, it, what the, the physiological state of your tree is when you're spraying. So this, uh, this is an apple right here, and this is apple fruit bud development. So in photo number one, we have our dormant, and where, there's my cursor. Um, so this is when you're applying dormant oil. So right now, then we have these other stages. We have silver tip, we have green tip, and this, this half inch green, if you've had different foliar problems over the years, like cedar apple rust, let's say, this would be a good time to apply a fungicide. Um, so that's that half inch green. Now we we're talking we we see we're down to the flowers. So don't spray now. And just have to keep reminding people don't spray now because the, you have pollinators that are very active on the flowers. Uh, you don't want to kill those. But this is really the prime time to spray for your fruit caterpillars, for your oriental fruit moths, for your codling moths. And what I also like to do right about this time, actually before I spray a BT or something like that, uh, is I like to thin those fruits out. That way I can thin out any of the fruits that are malformed, or in some cases, fruits that I can already tell have been compromised. Uh, but BT, and we're gonna talk about BT in a little bit, is a, uh, it's a, a biological, uh, it's basically Bacillus thuringiensis. It's, a, it's a, a biological that works uh, on the, on the intestines of the caterpillars. So they eat something that's been sprayed with BT and they'll basically die. So here we are with pears and just so you know what it looks like, but that's petal fall on pears. Uh, and these are just the different stages. Peaches kind of have a, a, a different physiology, but this is what's called uh, shuck split and shuck split is that perfect time to be spraying, once again, BT or spinosad. Now here's the dormant up here and here's the swollen bud. So, but right as we're kind of going from dormant to swollen bud, if you've had problems with peach leaf curl, now is the time to be spraying your copper fungicide to uh, hopefully get rid of that peach leaf curl problem. All right, so let's talk about some of these uh, insecticides and fungicides. Uh, dormant oil, there are a lot of dormant oil products out there. Um, and 
really anymore. It's it's kind of the they're they're almost getting uh, renamed horticultural oils. Horticultural oils are a little bit uh, lighter grade, um, but uh, they're still kind of a they're still a petroleum byproduct. So, um, but uh, so you could use a horticultural dormant oil now, but then you can also use them in the summertime and use them at a a, a lighter rate. Um, so with the, because these, these oils act by basically smothering uh, insects. And there are some organic, uh, uh, organic brands of horticultural oils out there. Uh, I think of one right now, Monterey uh, makes a horticultural oil that is certified for organic use. Monterey and a lot of other um, uh, companies make a spinosad uh, insecticide. And spinosad uh, basically is a, a, it's a, it's a product off of a fermented, uh, I think it was a ferment, found fermenting in rum barrels somewhere in the Caribbean. And it turns out that this actually works uh, on the nervous system of insects. So uh, from there, uh, there have now been multiple formulations of sp spinosa made available. Uh, and so it does, it, it, it works uh, not only by contact uh, with the insect, but it also works by the insect in ingesting uh, the, the compound. And so it works for a number of different insects, for codling moths, oriental fruit moths, uh, plum cucurlio, yes, but that's still very, very difficult. Um, so we saw the, uh, the, the shuck split. Uh, this would be a good time to spray spinosad, is at that shuck split time or that petal fall time. So, um, and with, with this, you will want to keep reapplying. And with all of, all of these insecticides, it's not like the, there's a, a one spray and you're done. Um, and especially if you have a lot of fruit trees and know you've had oriental fruit moth uh, year in and year out, you will probably want to be spraying this in combination with uh, with BT as, as you go throughout the season. And a little caveat with all of these insecticides: do you now read read the directions uh, because you need to need to understand sort of you know of course mixing you need to understand uh, how to spray. And actually, just as important as how to spray is also when to spray. Uh, so a lot of people have questions, well, is this going to actually harm pollinators? And in some cases, in some cases it will. Uh, so the, the best time to spray then is as we're uh, nearing dusk, because bees, they're, they're going home for the evening. So they, they, they'll be out of the picture. So you spray this right around dusk, you won't have inter, any interference with a number of the pollinators. So neem oil, and there are once again, a lot of formulations of neem out there. Uh, so uh, we, we happen to utilize this brand of neem with the Giving Grove, but uh, like I say, there are a lot of different products that contain neem. What neem does is it, uh, it ends up uh, affecting the insect so it will not go to the next stage of its life. So with the caterpillars we saw in, in the earlier diagram, it will stop it at its second instar. And so it won't be able to grow into the third instar 
and then uh, make it all the way into the pupation stage. Um, we, we utilize neem also as a trunk spray uh, for peach tree borers uh, throughout the summer. And oftentimes, because neem is an oil, uh, you, you, wanna, you wanna have it more dilute on, for foliar applications, but for applications on the trunk or on the wood, you can have it uh, at a at a strong stronger strength, so just keep in mind that that all oil type products do and will burn foliage, especially in the heat of summer. Here's something I talked about earlier uh, when I was talking about Japanese beetles, and this is a product that has a, a wide variety of uses. So this is uh, this is. Uh, called surround and it is a clay. So it is a very fine clay product. Um, so what it does is you mix this up. It's a wettable powder. You mix it up in a sprayer and uh, then you can, you will spray this on as a crop protectorant. So you spray it on your apples, you spray it on your peaches, and a lot of the insects that otherwise would be laying their eggs on that fruit, they find that surface inhospitable and will not lay their eggs on the fruit. So this isn't an insecticide per se, but is a crop protectorant. Um, the problem with this product is it's somewhat difficult to use. And, and when you use it, you're using a lot of it. Uh, so you, you see the, the rate down there, you're using a half a pound per gallon of water. Uh, and so this is a, a powdered clay, you're stirring, you're stirring and mixing and mixing, uh, and then you're spraying. It does gum up the sprayer and it definitely cannot be used in, uh, in a battery powered uh, uh, mechanized pump sprayer. It can be used in a manual pump sprayer, no problem, but most of the uh, battery powered ones will clog up. But I will tell you it does work and uh, it is it's not being an insecticide. It's actually a little bit safer, although it is uh, very dusty uh, is, is because it is a powder. Here is BT, and I referred to that earlier. Um, this is something that oftentimes uh, we will rotate this throughout the growing season. Uh, uh, we'll rotate this with the spinosad, uh, both the spinosad and BT. Well, uh, with the exception of BT actually only works on caterpillars. Spinosad uh, is a little bit more broad spectrum. But uh, this is something that can be used as a petal fall spray or throughout the season. There are a lot of formulations uh, of this. Uh, there is a wettable powder formulation. Uh, and in some cases, it is certified for organic use, in some cases not. And then there are the various uh, pyrethrums and pyrethrins and pyrethroids that are out there. Uh, these are, are all uh, synthesized from uh, chrysanthemums. And uh, this is a direct contact insecticide. Uh, in some cases is good when you have uh, a big outbreak of, of aphids or something like that. Uh, but, but do keep in mind that uh, this, this is incredibly broad spectrum. And, and so uh, definitely use it during the dusk hours because you do risk uh, 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 killing pollinators. And then there are a lot of other uh, uh, natural agents out there and, and some of these act as repellents. Uh, so we will actually plant garlic chives or onion chives uh, around our peach trees. And we, we do that to repel the greater peach tree bore. Now it's, it's, it's essential to also cut these back 
during the, the growing season when the, the adult boars are flying and are laying their eggs, but it basically acts as, as sort of a repellent and a scent disruptor. So instead of this mother peach tree borer you know, seeking out uh, the, the trunk of a peach tree, you know, there's, there's this garlic, there's this onion odor that's kind of getting in the way of the process. And so she moves on. Um, so things like that do work. Um, but the, the thing about a, a lot of these is the, the studies aren't there. The, the university research is not there. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the, the garlic manufacturers of America haven't paid for research into these university studies. Um, but, but this kind of stuff, it works, but it's not, it's not once again, one silver bullet. So garlic planted around your peach tree that's sprayed with neem throughout the season, yes, that can work. So, so just keep that in mind. And then there are a lot of these other oils that can overwhelm or kill insects, but oftentimes there's not the literature out there to say, well, this will have adverse effect on the foliage Etc. So just keep that in mind. And then there are other things that sort of take the more holistic approach to plant health care. And if you read in any of Michael Phillips' work, um, he, he's written the book, The Holistic Orchard. He talks about these things and, and it's, it's more of a, it's a whole plant approach. So rather than focusing on, on the insect that causes the problem or the disease that causes the problem. Let's talk about the soil conditions and the health of the plant that might also be leading to some of these problems and what we can then do to either help strengthen the leaf tissue or the bud tissue or you know, provide nutrients to the tree. So, so there's, there, there's a lot out there and it, it does, it takes a, a more holistic approach to caring for your trees uh, that, and then the, the better you care for the trees, they will, are, are less likely to get infected by diseases or insects. So now I want to get into more of the sort of uh, the, the fauna uh, that's not uh, insect fauna uh, out there. And uh, many, many of us face these problems. And so, so what do we do about it? Um, so deer are a big issue, uh, you know, year in and year out, I, I get photos and I have to diagnose, yes, that's, that's a deer that, uh, uh, the, the young bucks are rubbing up against the trunk in October and November and causing that scarring. Or maybe you have rabbits that have uh, gnawed away at the base of the tree. And that definitely happens year in and year out. Every winter, the rabbits are looking for food. They're gnawing at the base of the tree. So, so you put things like tree wraps on for the first couple of years. Um, maybe you have to put a cage around your tree to keep the deer from just nibbling back on it or in some cases rubbing their antlers on it and absolutely killing it. Um, maybe you have to put baffles or, or metal flashing or something around your tree to keep raccoons and squirrels from climbing up and stealing your harvest. So all of this is something you just need to, you, you may need to do. And you also need to tell people to keep their weed whackers away from the trunks on your trees. That is the number one killer of our trees out there. Uh, so good communication with who, whomever is doing the weed eating and mowing is an absolute must. And then there's bird protection. 
And uh, this is one of those things where I absolutely hate bird netting. Bird netting kills birds. And, and I don't think we were out there to be killing birds. We, we want to get a harvest, but uh, birds get caught in that and they can't get out and then they die. So one thing uh, a few years ago, I, I caught this commercial grower of blackberries. He gave a presentation about this product called Humming Line, which you can go to flyawaybirdies.com. <laughs> uh, you can find this stuff. It's like audio cassette, uh, if anybody remembers audio cassettes. So it's, it's very similar to that, but uh, has a little bit more tensile strength. And you string this up above the crop that you are trying to protect. And it emits a both high and low frequency sound that the birds, they go away. It kind of spooks them, they go away. So it's helped protect a lot of our cherry crops. It's helped protect a lot of our blackberry crops. So any, any berry crops that you have, uh, this is a, a very effective way to just deter the birds. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, a lot of this wildlife will, in some cases, get used to, to what you have and your different, uh, different techniques. Sometimes you just need to change things up. And, and so there's, once again, there's no silver bullet to, uh, to all of this. Uh, maybe you need inflatable snakes. Maybe you need old CDs hanging from the trees. So, so it's, it's a multifaceted approach when it comes to some of these critters. So finally, this is just kind of the, uh, a few of the resources that we use. Uh, so uh, we'll get a lot of our organic pest material, uh, uh, pesticides uh, uh, through Arbico Organics. Uh, they sell a lot of organic uh, insecticides, fungicides. They also sell uh, beneficial nematodes, which can, can also be handy for controlling some insect pests like peach tree borers, like cucumber beetles. Uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply is another one. Uh, for, for more sort of uh, like pheromone traps and things like that, uh, we utilize, utilize Great Lakes IPM. So let's say you're looking for uh, uh, Oriental fruit moth or coddling moth pheromones and, and the wing traps, you can go to them. Uh, and uh, then just as far as kind of learning more, uh, Cornell University is just a wealth of knowledge as far as growing fruit trees uh, and, and vegetables for that matter. And, and so so, so poke around their, their integrated pest management uh, page on their website. And uh, you, like I say, wealth of information. If you're into odd fruits, uh, the North American Fruit Explorers, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a good organization. And, and they, they, uh, they have a good little chat board about different things. Um, so I referenced Michael Phillips Holistic Orchard. That's, uh, that's what we use a lot of for our Give and Grove program. And then if you're uh, looking for a little bit more information on berries, uh, the Berry Growers Companion. And then finally, uh, Lee Reich, and, and he's written a couple of books and, and actually uh, has, a, has a really good blog that is uh, worth signing up for as well. Uh, but uh, Uncommon Fruits Worthy of Attention, and then he has a great pruning book out there too. So uh, these are all things that we utilize, and uh, I know uh, we've had a lot of questions, and hopefully, uh, hopefully Carter is uh, keeping up with that, but uh, uh, if they're, you know, feel free to uh, uh, leave if you don't have any more questions, and we are going to make this uh, presentation available to, uh, to everyone. Uh, I'm not sure how quickly we're gonna get that turned around, but we, we do have your information. And so we could, we could send that out. Hey, Ella. <laughs> uh, so we, we can send that out to you uh, a little bit later. Yeah, flyawaybirdies.com. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, good. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Um. 
Matt, we did have a question I wasn't able to answer. Oh, okay. How do you tell if you have a primocaine or a fluorocaine version of raspberry? Um, well, uh, I guess, so you don't remember the variety, I guess, is that's the, 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 the previous. <laughs> um, so it can be difficult this time of year. So leave the cane to grow. And if the cane actually puts on flowers in June, if it puts on flowers and fruits in June, that is a flora cane. Now, my guess is because uh, raspberry biology is what it is, it, they, they can do both. So, so even a Caroline or a Heritage has a, a flora cane component to it, but it just depends on how it's managed. So if you see old fruits or the, the old parts of the flower and the fruit on the wood right now, that means it's the, it's the primocane from last year. It needs to be cut down. If you don't see any instances of old fruits, that can be a flora cane for this June. So uh, it's it's confusing at best, I know, uh, because because these these plants they send up both uh, throughout the growing season. But as, as for, for the way we do things, it, it makes sense to treat most of our raspberries as flora cane, as in we're cutting them back. Right now, we're letting them grow. They flower all at once in that July, August time frame, and, and the fruit all comes on then. However, you can treat them so you get 10 to 15% of the canes that will fruit for you in June. It just means you have more to cut back in June. So long story, Barbara Bowling and her berry book can, uh, can, can help with that question a little bit too. And to be clear, when you say cut back, you mean to the crown or otherwise known as an inch above the ground? Yeah, uh, you could actually cut it back to the ground. Okay. Any any other odd ones out there? There's a question about fertilizing when planting, but uh, I don't know if you want to talk about amendments a little bit. Well, so fertilizing with planting, I would definitely shy away from doing that. Um, and and the reason being there, uh, you you actually don't want too much growth in your first year, so. Uh, just go ahead and, and you, you will plant your tree. Now, soil amendments is sort of another story. And, and so adding a little bit of compost when you plant, I think is a good idea. Uh, in some cases, if you have a soil test, you may also want to uh, take the recommendations from that soil test. Now, when we plant trees, we, we always add, uh, well, not always, but most of the time, we, we definitely add mycorrhizal fungus, which is a, basically it works symbiotically with the root system and helps the root system get established in the soil and will help pull up nutrients through the soil. We will also add soil sulfur if our pH is above seven on the soil. And the reason being there is most of the, the fruit trees that we plant, they like a, a soil pH of right around 6.5. So we'll add a, a tablespoon of sulfur uh, in the hole to help bring that pH down a little bit. The other thing that we will also add is a little bit of bone meal which uh, uh, what bone meal is, it's a natural source of phosphorus. 
and 95% uh, of our soil tests tell us that, well, it's probably more like 99% of our soil tests tell us that our phosphorus is incredibly low in our soil. And so phosphorus is needed for both root growth and uh, fruit bud development. So, so we add those things when we plant, but well, we, we try to make sure we get soil tests on those sites uh, first off and, and uh, just to, because you don't want to add sulfur if your pH is already at 5.5. Uh, uh, that 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 wouldn't make sense. So so soil tests can be helpful. <laughs> Those are the main ones. Um, I think for the most part, I answered the other questions. If people have questions, um, feel free to put them in the the chat. Or I suppose at this time you can unmute yourself. Um, there's a question about finding a wasp's nest when pruning and should that be removed? Uh, I don't think they um, put well, in their nest, do they? Yeah, so uh, if, if pruning this time of year, yeah, I, I would just go ahead and uh, remove it. Uh, the wasps, they, they don't go back to the same nest. So, um, and one thing I'm not entirely sure, and it, it, this is probably species by species, and there are a lot of wasps out there. I'm not sure if uh, the, uh, the adult is in there at the time. Uh, so going through that pupation stage, uh, if that's the case, maybe you just relocate the wasp nest. You know, wasps are, are uh, pretty beneficial insects uh, as much as they can be uh, very territorial and, and very painful. But uh, a lot of wasps, they actually go off and hunt caterpillars during the daytime. So, so you, you might want to relocate the nest. Uh, what's this? Is it similar to diatomaceous earth? Did that question get answered? I wasn't sure what exactly it was being compared to. Um, my guess is there were, I think it was when you were talking about surround. Yeah, so uh, surround is, uh, yeah, yeah. Kaolin clay is, is different than diatomaceous earth. Um, so diatomaceous earth also can can be used as an insecticide, and it's it's used uh, as a dry powder. Um, it's not something that you would really be using in your trees at all. Uh, but uh, kaolin clay is is used as a wettable powder, as in your you're mixing water in uh, with with the with the clay. Uh, the other thing about diatomaceous earth is it is incredibly fine, even finer than kale and clay, and you really do have to uh, uh, wear a mask or something uh, when you're applying that, and normally you'd be applying it to a vegetable crop, uh, definitely wouldn't be applying it to a fruit crop. All right, well, um, thank you all for attending. And I believe we are still having a pruning workshop next week, but it, I'm not sure it may be all filled up. Haven't, uh, haven't looked at that. So, but get out there and enjoy the weather. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit and bye-bye. Uh,